the Annapolis story. The story of the United States Naval Academy and the men who make up the brigade. Men from every state in the Union. Men who have come to Annapolis to become professional officers in the world's largest Navy. This is the story of marching men, of books, slide rolls, and of acres of white caps and gold buttons. It is the story of a way of life that develops tomorrow's leaders today. This is the United States Naval Academy located here in the historic seaport of Annapolis, Maryland. The Naval Academy is neither a university nor a training school. It is distinctly a naval college, established and maintained for the sole purpose of providing career officers for the naval service. On graduation, in addition to commissions in the United States Navy or Marine Corps, these men will receive Bachelor of Science degrees. Each summer, approximately 1,200 men between the ages of 17 and 22 receive appointments to Annapolis. Young men from every walk of life, from every kind of school, from everywhere in America. Some are rich, some are poor, but at the Naval Academy, they all start even. The majority of these men receive their appointments directly from members of Congress. Others are granted appointments from the President and the Vice President of the United States. Some win their appointments through open competitive examinations held throughout the country, while others receive appointments through competitive examinations within the Fleet and Naval Reserve. But no matter how these candidates receive their appointments, they all must pass the same rigid physical and academic requirements for admission. During the summer, while the three upper classes are on cruises to foreign ports, the newly appointed midshipman is quickly introduced into life in the Navy. Even before the stencil ink is dry on his first whites, the plebe's indoctrination begins. Straight up, Father. Chins in. Thirty inch steps. Thirty inch steps. All right, slow down there a bit. Look, when you tie a bowling right over left, remember, right over left. And there is marching and more marching. And there will be more and more. Then there is physical education, obstacle courses, and hours of testing muscles to their breaking point. And just when it finally seems as if they will break, it is time for seamanship and sailing. Behind these walls, the plebes, along with the rest of the brigade, will be housed for the next four years. This is Bancroft Hall, the largest dormitory in the world. But to a midshipman, Bancroft Hall is more than a dormitory. For four very important years of his life, Bancroft Hall and its miles of corridors, acres of deck space, and hundreds of rooms will be his home and the center of a new world. Virtually everything is provided for here at Bancroft Hall. There are barber shops, tailor shops, and a post office to handle the thousands of letters that are written and received daily, a tremendous galley, and a mess hall capable of seating an entire brigade of 4,000 men will also be found at Bancroft Hall. During three hours, you will find midshipmen in the store, at the soda fountain, and in recreational rooms. And if he is sick, he will be treated at the medical and dental quarters housed in the same Bancroft Hall. Just about the time the new midshipman actually learns his way around Bancroft Hall, plebe summer is over. The upper classes return, and he finds himself a part of the brigade. And he quickly acquires a new appreciation of what it is to be a plebe. Midshipman Hill, fourth class, sir. 
Let's see some wrinkles, Mr. Hill. Wait, wait, sir. Draw a brace, Mr. Hill. Wait, wait, sir. Take a drink. Wait, wait, sir. Get out, Mr. Hill. Wait, wait, sir. What time is it, Mr. Hill? Sir, I am greatly embarrassed and deeply humiliated that due to circumstances beyond my control, the inner workings and hidden mechanisms of my chronometer are in such in accord with the great sidereal movements with which time is commonly reckoned that I cannot with any degree of accuracy state the correct time. Without fear of being too far wrong, however, I would say that it is 45 minutes, 30 seconds, and 20 ticks past the hour, sir. Throw a better brace, Mr. Hill. You have your quarters on, Mr. Hill? Yes, sir. Yes, it Plebe spends a great deal of time learning the right answers to questions. He also gets a lot of practice bracing, squaring corners, and traveling on the double, doing many things not required of the upper class. The Plebe, who wears no stripes on his uniform, looks forward to the day when he will wear the one diagonal stripe of a third classman. The two diagonal stripes of a second classman and finally, the horizontal stripe of a first classman. If he rises to officer rank in the brigade, he will wear additional stripes to indicate his rank. Pass and review! of midshipmen is administered by midshipmen officers of the first or senior class, selected for their outstanding leadership. By a system of rotation of stripers, as these midshipmen officers are called, opportunity for exercising leadership is offered to most members of the first class. The life of a midshipman is a rigorous one. The routine and strict discipline which distinguishes life at the academy from life at civilian universities breeds the close comradeship and mutual understanding that leads to enduring friendships and helps create the high spirit of the brigade and the navy. A midshipman's day begins at Reveille at 6.15 a.m. He rises and prepares himself for breakfast formation. Thirty minutes later, he begins a day of study, lectures, recitation, drills, and laboratory work that keeps him busy until four o'clock. At that time, the midshipman is free to participate in sports and extracurricular activities until 7 p.m. After evening meal, he returns to his academic studies in his room. His study hours end at 10. Fifteen minutes later, finds him turned in for the night, ending another day in the Annapolis story. Unless, of course, he has the watch. The training and experience gained here on the watch squad in carrying out the day's routine will be invaluable to the midshipman when he's called upon to stand watches aboard ship and perform administrative duties ashore. Saturday at noon, the week's work comes to a close at last. And that afternoon normally finds the brigade of midshipmen cheering their teams in a score of intercollegiate sports. Quite frequently, the weekends feature hops and concerts. When they do, the rhythm and cadence of marching feet are quickly replaced by the rustle of skirts and the romantic melodies of the dance orchestra. Through these reception lines pass some of the prettiest girls in America. Some, the girl back home. Others, the drag for the weekend. And still others, the one and only of a life. On Sunday, the chapel, with its great dome and golden spire, calls the future naval officers to worship. 
those not worshiping here attend a church of their own choosing in the city of Annapolis. Within the sanctuary of the chapel, voices are lifted in praise and prayer. Shipman renews that quiet confidence born of trust in God and knows that he is not alone in the daily battle of life. The course of study prescribed at Annapolis places primary emphasis on basic education in order that a firm foundation may be laid for the continuing development of its graduates. All midshipmen at the Naval Academy take the same course of study so that all graduates may be equipped equally to perform the duties of naval officers. The only elective in the four-year course is in the field of foreign languages. Here they may choose any one of six languages men you see are studying Spanish. Yo hablaba mm -hmm. todo. Good, that's good. Thank you. Whenever possible, classes are kept small to individualized instruction. In classrooms like this, Every opportunity is given the midshipman to study and absorb as much as he possibly can. Modern weapons and devices are made available to aid the midshipman in the more professional subjects. Visual aids, cutaways, and models assist them in visualizing many of the technical courses. Some are authentic models built to scale like this engine room. Others are life-size, like this boiler of a destroyer. In addition, the Academy encourages the midshipmen to recognize and analyze critically the foreign and domestic problems of our times, problems which are illuminated by the yearly visits abroad. Literature and history are also stressed because of their importance in the development of character, breadth of vision, and a high sense of value. The future naval officers cannot learn all they need to know from books. Practical instruction is included to ensure effective application of theoretical background, and at the same time to provide the fleet with officers who are of immediate usefulness. the largest amount of the professional training is accomplished when the midshipmen are at sea during the summer months. 
During these periods, the midshipmen fill regular billets in crews of operating ships of the Navy. They learn at first hand the duties of seamen and petty officers, executing many of the same orders they themselves will give someday as naval officers. Cruises are made each summer by the upper classes in battleships, carriers, and other ships of the fleet. And during part of one summer, the midshipmen even go on a full-dress amphibious operation. performance of duties on these cruises in engineering, gunnery, navigation and communications, aviation and tactics, the midshipmen are able to supplement by experience what they have learned in the classroom. It is this integration of practice with theory that forms the core of the educational program at Annapolis. A program which has one aim, the developer who think clearly and who act decisively. Years will add wisdom to the minds of these future officers, but the heritage and traditions imparted here at Annapolis will also be important factors in their eventual success. crypt of John Paul Jones, father of the United States Navy, reposes in the chapel. His definition of an officer still serves as the ideal for all in the naval service. It is by no means enough that an officer of the Navy should be a capable mariner. He should be that, of course, but also a great deal more. He should be as well a gentleman of liberal education fine manners, punctilious courtesy, and the nicest sense of personal honor. From the day midshipmen enter the academy, the heritage and tradition of our gallant Navy becomes a part of them. I have not yet begun to fight. The spirit and courage of each naval hero from John Paul Jones on down through Farragut and Dewey serve as an inspiration for every midshipman. This spirit is handed down from class to class. We have met the enemy, and they are ours. It is this spirit that guides and steadies every officer as he makes his decision. The weapons and ships may be different, but the determination and courage are the same. Life at the Naval Academy is not all history, study, and drill. Ensure that these future officers are physically fit to withstand the rigors of life at sea, an extensive athletic program is conducted here. An athletic program which demands the participation of every midshipman, either in intercollegiate or intramural sports. The athletic program at the Naval Academy is designed to develop such qualities as group loyalty, team spirit and fair play, and the ability to think quickly under pressure. Four 
400 intramural play more than 3,000 contests in 24 different sports each year. The victories counting as points in intercompany competition to determine the honor company at the academy. In addition to this extensive intramural program, varsity and junior varsity teams are, of course, fielded in every intercollegiate sport. Sports ranging from track and wrestling to such events as rifle and golf. Each year from these ranks of the Navy Blue and Gold come some of the nation's sporting greats to receive recognition, their letters, and their trophies for the highest honors in athletics. An opportunity for self-expression is also given the midshipmen in a variety of extracurricular activities. For those interested in writing, there are the weekly magazines, the log and the splinter, as well as the academy yearbook, The Lucky Bag. Then there are after-dinner speaking sessions, two radio stations, and a number of dramatic clubs. For those inclined, there is a dance band, a drum and bugle corps, the glee club and choir, as well as other activities from sailing to chess. Yes, many things are crowded into four full years. In that time, a midshipman does a lot, hears a lot, and sees a lot more. <laughs> As graduation draws near, memories of four full years crowd the minds of the future officers. Memories of left-handed salutes and a shower of pennies to Tecumseh, god of 2.5, the passing grade at the academy. Memories of anchor man ceremonies and no more plebes. A day no plebe forgets because when the smallest member of his class touches the top of this monument, the plebes become upperclassmen. Then there are memories of the class ring dance and liberty in foreign ports. What midshipman could ever forget liberty? For to a midshipman, every precious minute, hour, and day spent on liberty has meant too much to be forgotten easily. Memories, yet many, many more. Of the Jolly Roger and of crossing the equator for the first time. Memories of pollywogs and shellbacks and an audience with His Majesty Neptunus Rex. And then, it's the biggest June week of all. With its parties, parades, and the traditional presenting of colors to the honor company by the color girl. Finally, the crowning event of all, the culmination of four years of effort, graduation. During your four years at the Naval Academy, we have constantly worked at the task of molding you into junior officers. For you, the process has probably been long and hard. In the four years that have passed, you have absorbed much of the knowledge and instruction offered you. You have grown in stature, you have accepted responsibility, and you've been found reliable. There are potentially great military leaders in your ranks. Only time can tell 
how many of you will take your place in history? Gentlemen, you're off to a fine start. Good luck. fly into the rafters in the traditional manner, and another class has graduated. Another class has received Bachelor of Science degrees and has been commissioned as ensigns in the United States Navy. Or a second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps. But this is not the end of the story. For this story has no ending. As four years pass into memory for one class, they just begin for another. The cast of characters constantly changes, but the story is always the same. Quiet dedication to a life of service to God and country. Because men will always find it necessary to go down to the sea in ships to defend their land, their homes, and their freedom. The Annapolis story will never end.